Welcome again, everybody, to Weird Mythic Podcast. I'm Naomi, and of course, I am here with the lovely Serena. Hey, girl. Hey. Hey. (laughs) So, I apologize if I sound nasally at all, because I have horrible allergies right now, and the stupid 24-hour pill that you're supposed to take to get rid of them doesn't fucking work. Oh, so no. I feel like it works for, like, the first two hours, and then you can't take it anymore, so it just doesn't work for, like, the other 22 hours of the day. Dude, I don't even know if it worked at all. I've been sneezing since yesterday afternoon, and then I've been sneezing all day at work. I apologize. I was like, I'm sorry, everyone. You're going to hear sniffles all day. Like, so I'm hoping it goes away soon. I've been drinking tea all day, but it doesn't seem to help. So. It's always one of us that's ill. Always. And it's not like I'm even sick. It's legit just allergies. Like, my eyes water a little bit. and uh, You know, yeah. all that great stuff. <laughs> I was going to say, how has your week been? I haven't talked to you at all. It was busy. Work has been so insanely busy. We're, like, fully in, like, the 90s from now until probably the end of summer. It's been so busy, but update. Last episode, we were talking about going to see Doctor Strange, and it was so good. Dude, it was freaking awesome. Everyone, like any Marvel fan or Doctor Strange fan, go freaking see it. I was not expecting that. Can we do spoilers? You want to do like a little spoiler? No, it's it's just came (laughs) out. We can't do that. Ah, but I really wasn't expecting it. (laughs) You know, we'll talk about it after we hang up the episode. Fine. (laughs) But we are going to be at the Dallas True Crime Podcast Festival in August. So yes, we are. There's that. <laughs> so there's that. I'm actually I will be hitting you up probably Sunday or Monday. So because I'll be buying my ticket this week. I have enough money put Yay! aside that I can finally buy my fucking ticket and not be totally broke. Nice. So <laughs> give me two more paychecks and I'll get the hotel. <laughs> We're still homeless. Okay. <laughs> well, it'll work out. It'll be fine. It'll work out. <laughs> if we have to sleep in my car or pitch a tent. It'll work out. Check this out. So my dad was telling me that he's going to get a room at the hotel. So fuck it. We'll just take his room and he can sleep in his trailer. (laughs) How funny. Him and Matt will push them out of the room. (laughs) Oh, Matt's going to go? Probably. He always comes along. So It'll be nice to meet the guy who's interrupted so many of our episodes. (laughs) For real. All right. Well, I mean... Besides that, I got my mom actually, she she kind of surprised my brother over Mother's Day weekend. He was super excited to see her, hung out for a few days, and mom actually stayed the night over at my house last night, so we hung out for a while. I oh, missed yay. her. I miss you, mom. I'm so happy she was here. Yay, so. that's so much fun. Uh, I know, I was so excited for you when you told me, I like texted you, I was like, did he, did he cry? Like, what happened? <laughs> no, he, he actually saw her pull in, and he was like... I was so confused because someone came into work and it looked just like my mom. <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm like, that's not mom. Who the hell looks like my mom? And so he walks out of the warehouse towards the truck and then sees mom and goes, the fuck? <laughs> like, it was more of like a shock and surprise because he saw her, didn't think it was mom, and then was like, nobody else looks like mom. That has to be mom. <laughs> that's so. almost funnier though. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Well, what is our topic this week? We are talking about haunted things. I'll say haunted things because yours isn't an object. Exactly. Yeah. So we originally thought haunted objects and we found some. We both found an object. But then I found something that's not technically an object and I kept doing research on it. So (laughs) that's what I'll be talking about also. In true Naomi fashion. Exactly. I found something else. (laughs) Well, can I go first this week? I would love it because I am super excited to hear yours. I'm going to be talking about the A Dybbuk box. The Dybbuk box. Yes. Yeah. One of many. Because apparently you can buy these on Etsy. I don't know. All right. You can buy a Dybbuk box on Etsy? (laughs) Yeah, they're like, it's so weird. Back in 2001 is where our story starts. So 
there was this guy. His name was Kevin Manis, and he was out visiting yard sales looking for supplies because he basically, he owns like this furniture restoration shop thing. So he was out looking for like furniture to restore. And he came upon an old wine cabinet and he purchased the cabinet from the granddaughter of a recently deceased Holocaust survivor named Havela. Hopefully I said that right. Havela. Mm -hmm. When Havela immigrated to the United States, the wine cabinet was one of three things that she brought with her. And when Manis bought the box, the granddaughter told him that her grandmother always kept it shut um, and out of reach because there was a Dybbuk living inside of it. So she was like, no touchy, don't open. And what is a Dybbuk? That's my next line. <laughs> okay. In Jewish mythology, a Dybbuk is a malicious possessing spirit believed to be the dislocated soul of a person who has died. Um, once the host, oh, sorry, it supposedly leaves the body of the host once it has accomplished its goal, sometimes after it's been exercised. So that's what a Dybbuk huh. is. It's spelled two different ways, D-I-B-B-U-K and D-Y-B-B-U-K. And again, it's part of like Jewish mythology. So the seller told Manis that the box was never to be opened and that if it was, bad things would happen. So naturally, he takes the box back to his shop with plans to restore it and give it to his mother for her birthday. After okay. opening... The, I know, right? Like, good gift. <laughs> <laughs> like, after having that warning, do you really love your mother? That's, like, immediately <laughs> what he did. So I'm just like, why? <laughs> yeah. Um, after opening the cabinet, he found a series of strange objects inside. He found two U.S. pennies dating 1925 and 1928, two locks of hair both tied together with string, a dried rosebud, a four-legged cast iron candlestick holder, a golden goblet, and a granite sculpture inscribed with the Hebrew word shalom. I hope I said that right. That's how I always hear it said, but... It, it sounded right to me. <laughs> All right. And then um, the Shema, I think that's how you say that. It's S-H-E-M-A, was a prayer that was considered to be the most important in Judaism and was carved in the back of the cabinet. Manus gave the box to his mother, Ida, on Halloween. Side note, I think her birthday was like October 28th or something like that. Okay. There's a YouTube video where she like talks about her experience when she opened up the box. So she describes a feeling of an, like an extremely cold breeze immediately come out of the box when she opens the doors. And then right away she had a stroke. Oh, shit. Yeah. Over the course of two years, she's okay now, by the way. Over the course of, <laughs> over the course, oh, I don't know if she's still alive, but after that she was she fine. She was fine after yeah. that. <laughs> over the course of two years, many mysterious events befell Manus and those around him. His sister got creeped out because the doors would open on their own. His brother and sister-in-law would smell strange odors coming from the box, like cat urine and jasmine. Ooh. Manus and his si yeah, gross, right? Manus and his siblings suffered from the same reoccurring nightmares of an old woman with sunken in eyes. The brother of a store employee died by suicide shortly after visiting the shop and knocking the cabinet off of the shelf, and then a few years later, that worker also took his own life. Oh shit. Super sad. Wow. And I guess they were keeping it like in the store now at that point. Um, Manus at one point tried to give the cabinet to his girlfriend, but after keeping it for a while, she basically was like, take this shit back. I do not want it. Right. So she forced him to take it back. And then shortly after that, he began seeing shadow figures in his peripheral vision, which is always a fucking fun sign, right? Shadow figures. <laughs> and then in 2003... Manus listed the box for sale with the title Dybbuk Haunted Jewish Wine Cabinet Box on eBay. <laughs> the listing detailed how Manus got the box, the strange happenings, as well as why he wanted to get rid of it. Toward the end of the description, he actually wrote, help me. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he was like, please. He's like, somebody please just take this <laughs> yeah. from me. In June of 2003, Jason Haxton won the auction after hearing about it from a colleague. Jason states that when the box arrived, he put his hands on it and he felt like it collapsed into liquid. But clearly, like, it didn't. It was still standing. But that's, like, the feeling that he got. 
Oh, how strange. Right? He also said that he felt like a knife was stabbing him in the gut. And when he would go to bed at night, he would have terrible dreams of the hag that came with the box. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Which is very similar to the reoccurring the nightmares. That, in, yeah, yeah, exactly. The second in eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Jason Haxon purchased the box for $280 and the cabinet contained the same objects that it did when Manus purchased it. So it had the, everything in there still, like the statue, the hair, which the hair, I feel like is the creepiest part, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> um, he was very skeptical and he considered himself science-based He said that he didn't believe in the stories that were associated with the box. But shortly after purchasing the box, he began experiencing what he called a tidal wave of bad luck. He got very... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a lot of it, I guess. (laughs) He got very ill and no one could figure out why. Um, Haxton says that all of his bad luck and problems actually disappeared when he followed a rabbi's advice and placed the wine cabinet into a gold-lined wooden container to negate the spirits haunting it. He now keeps the container inside a military grade case, which he has buried into the earth. So, oh, it's there. Did he still. say where he buried it? No, and I don't think he will because there's been a ton of people who have like tried to buy it from him for like outrageous prices, and he will not. He's like absolutely not. So good for him for not wanting to like spread that shit. Right. <laughs> but yeah, super creepy. Wow. Okay. Huh. I didn't realize that it was on eBay. Yeah, that's, that's how hilarious. yeah, that's how you got it. And now they say you can buy like Dybbuk boxes online and like Etsy and I don't know how accurate they are, but they're like out there. So Yeah, but I thought like the whole point of a Dybbuk box is because you put the Dybbuk in there and you don't want it out. I think that is what it turned into because there was like a there's a lot on the internet about like what it is for i feel like it's like what we think of when we hear like pandora's box oh okay i don't know what pandora's box is but that's what i think of (laughs) i'm like something's (laughs) locked inside of it and when you open it it gets out right like to me that's what i think of so that's what i thought too and it could be that i just know that's the story of this one particular dybbuk box did you find any other sources saying that maybe there's other dybbuk boxes out there or in like you know folklore and jewish tradition talk about it well okay so with the dybbuk i i feel like a lot of people were saying no because they possess people like how is it that it could possess this non-living thing and live in the box because that's not what a dybbuk does but who's to fucking say not me right I love the line that you said when it was a dislocated soul. I was like, that just creeps me Isn't out. Isn't that so for some creepy? Reason. And then, like, the part about it, like, accomplishing something. I'm like, um, yeah. excuse me. Yeah. It's like those, um, like, vampires that we talked about in India that will only come and create havoc and then leave. Yeah. Like, they feed on negative energy. Yeah. So scary and then yeah like i said that youtube video is out there if you want to hear from the mother's like own words what she went through and how she felt when she opened the you could tell like there was a lot online saying like it was made up and that the first guy just wrote all that stuff but like to i don't know could you manifest something like that i don't see why you couldn't like the fact that he's like a skeptic though that's what gets me yeah, and he didn't. He continued to be a skeptic by just calling it bad luck. He never blamed it on anything paranormal, really. He just said it was just a string yeah. of bad luck or a tidal wave in his case. Yeah, but clearly he does believe in it be- to some extent because why would you bury it? Like, you know what I mean? Go to those right. extreme measures to keep it from other people if you didn't believe in it. Something. Yeah. There was something enough to scare you for you to bury it and then never see anything about it again. That's my opinion, but yeah. (laughs) No, I think I totally agree with you. Like, there, something had to have happened for him to bury the box, not want to sell it or put it back on eBay, because obviously if people are hitting him up to get the box and he's still saying, no, I'm not doing that, he definitely believes something. Something happened to him. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, freaking creepy. 
And now you need to go watch that movie with Jeffrey Dean Morgan in it about the Dybbuk box. Okay. I don't remember the name of it. It might just be Dybbuk. Like, I don't remember what it's called. Or is it like The Possession or something? Because there's a couple different... It might be The Possession. Yeah, there's a couple different movies out there. There's like a play. There's a bunch of books. I think the the second guy, um, Haxton, I believe he wrote a book about the experiences that he had when he like, come on, if you're capitalizing off of this, I feel like you believe in it, right? Like, I agree. I agree with that. Definitely. There's some sort of there's some sort of degree of belief there, there's, even if it's yeah. little. There's something there's there for a, you to continue to talk about it. Yeah, there's a yeah. tinge of something if you're that afraid there and you suck you you seeked out like a rabbi like something spooked him to yeah. to believe that there was something with this box that he couldn't explain as a uh you know I now just said sucked my bad <laughs> <laughs> you sucked a rabbi <laughs> oh god but yeah <laughs> but yeah for him not believing in anything and a skeptic oh my gosh yeah. I don't know why that was so hard for me to remember for him to be a skeptic <laughs> and then seek out a rabbi. Yeah, I agree with you. He was definitely spooked by something. Yep, I agree. All right, well, what do you have for me? All right, well, I found a cursed painting. So, have I, I've never heard of the artist or of the painting, but as I started doing more research onto it, he's a pretty famous painter. Um, so, I'm going to talk about the painting itself first. So, the painting, it is called The Hands Resist Him. It was painted by the artist Bill Stoneham. He also, William Stoneham, but he goes by Bill. And he painted this back in 1972. So it's just a little painting and it's a young boy standing next to a female doll. It kind of looks like a ventriloquist dummy. Standing upright, both of them, in front of what looks like, to me, a glass door. And it's one of those glass doors or glass windows that has, like, the panels. So it, it's, like, three up top, three in the middle, and then three on bottom. So it's, like, it has little, like, sections in it. Okay, so my sliding glass door. Okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, like, standing in front of that, and the the female doll has something in her hands. And to me, this is what this painting looks like to me, guys. So she's holding something in her hands. And to me, it looks like a spray can of some sort, like a paint can or hairspray. But it also looks like there's vines or tentacles coming out of the top of this spray can. There's also handprints behind the boy and the doll on the on the window. So like if there was people behind them on the window and you only saw their handprints. There are about, how many did I count on there? I counted 11 hands in different spots behind the boy and the doll on the windows. I just looked this painting up. It is so <laughs> creepy. So, as I said, there. okay, so there's four rows of three panels. And on the top middle glass panel, it looks like what to be like a moon, like the reflection of a moon. And it, it's, it looks like it's almost inside with the hands. And above the female doll's head, it looks like to me what would be like a doorbell or a lock. So I looked up what the painting is from the artist. And this is what Bill Stoneham says it is. It is a boy, but the pic that the boy in the picture was actually based off of a picture of Bill himself from when he was around five years old. And there's a picture of him when he's five standing next to a like neighbor girl. So that's kind of the doll, but she was obviously a girl in the picture that he got the inspiration from, but he made it into a doll. The doorway, he says, represents the dividing line between reality and fantasy. The doll guides the boy through both worlds, and the hands the hands on, on the other side of the glass represent altern alternate lives. That's what it is. The thing in the girl's hand is also some sort of battery with wires coming out of it. So that's his explanation of his own painting. I hate this painting. <laughs> <laughs> so... He painted this in 1972, and the reason he painted this was because he had a contract with a, like, local um, gallery owner, and between him and the gallery owner, um, he had to present two different paintings every month for about $200. So 
this was one of those paintings and gave it to the gallery and he had it in the gallery from 1972 to 1974. In 1974, there was an art critic by the name of Henry Seldes and he did a, you know, piece on it. And I didn't find the piece. I probably should have. But it didn't, like, in the articles I read, never sounded like he said anything bad about the painting. Um, Oh, and the gallery owner for that uh, Bill gave the painting to, his name is John Marley. After John Marley purchased the um, painting, he actually passed away within the next couple years. I don't know why I don't have a date right now. But he did pass away soon after. And the art critic sadly passed away four years after seeing the painting. Oh, my goodness. So that's just a a little odd. Oh, I found it. Okay, so John Marley actually passed away that same year. Oh, no. Nope, that was 1974. He passed away in 1984. So it was, you know, a good 14 years later. But still, they had to put it in there in all of the articles. (laughs) So the owner of the gallery passed away and that was kind of the end of that gallery. I couldn't find anything of what happened to the gallery after that. So that was in 1984. No mention of the painting since then until the year 2000. Somebody found it, found the fucking painting behind a, behind a, um, what was a brewery, a brewery, like, an abandoned brewery that he just happened along it he was he called himself a picker so probably just looking for something valuable he was picking (laughs) so he was picking so he then sold it to a man named kim smith and this is in grand rapids michigan so this random person found the painting in the year 2000 behind a brewery and sold it to this guy kim smith kim smith had it in his house for a while, you know, and then didn't really like it. His son kept saying, Dad, that boy and the girl fight at night. And he's like, what? What do you you mean? It's a painting. I'm going to pass out. (laughs) So this kept happening. Oh, it was the daughter. Sorry, the daughter. Um, And this is specifically from Ken Smith. He said, one morning... Our four-and-a-half-year-old daughter claimed that the children in the picture were fighting and coming into the room during the night. She said this multiple times. Convinced her dad so much that these, you know, people in the paintings were coming out and fighting that he actually set up motion sensor cameras. And I could not find the photos, but apparently there are three pictures out there somewhere on the internet (laughs) that show... The boy actually moving in the picture. We and need it's a, the sleuths to do their thing. <laughs> I could not find it, you guys. I really tried. I could not find these photos, but apparently they're out there somewhere. And according to Ken, he even said that the boy left the painting, left the fucking painting. He said he left in a hurry. <laughs> I don't think to you get understand away. how much that makes me want to <laughs> throw up. <laughs> it's insane. So Ken then puts or kim sorry kim then i think i kept calling him ken his name is kim my bad so kim smith (laughs) finally decided i can't have this painting in my house anymore it's freaking my kids out i'm just i don't even want to look at it because my kid keeps telling me they're coming out it's freaking him out too so he puts the painting on ebay (laughs) which is just a strange (laughs) coincidence by the way guys that's why i laughed when she said ebay i was like no fucking way (laughs) So, he puts this painting onto eBay, and he does put a disclaimer on there. Um, it, it says, let me see. Oh, and of course, I can't find it off of my notes at the moment. Pretty much, Kim puts this painting up on the internet onto eBay and puts it up for bid. And he puts a disclaimer on there saying, you know, this might be haunted if you buy it. You can't sue me kind of thing. While that painting was on eBay, he got people sending him messages that for people who were just looking at the painting on eBay, that people were throwing up, legit throwing up and becoming ill from just the sight of the painting. Yeah, I can relate. Some people were, 
<laughs> Some people just fainted, others screamed, and others, mainly children, reported being gripped with unseen entity while looking at the oh, painting. And this no. is just on eBay. This is just on eBay that these kids would get scared looking at this painting. I knew I shouldn't have looked up the, that fucking picture. <laughs> I just got so sweaty. <laughs> oh, gosh. So while this was on eBay, Bill Stoneham, the artist, is still alive and was contacted by somebody being like, hey, your painting's on eBay and apparently it's haunted. <laughs> and he's just like, whatever. He really didn't have any comments. And he just like, okay, whatever. Doesn't matter to him. He thought it was funny because he's going like, how is this painting haunted, you know? Well, somebody finally bought the painting from Kim and he actually sold it for a thousand dollars or one thousand twenty five dollars. It went to Zach Baggins. Oh, you know who Zach Baggins yeah, is? Ghost adventure guy. <laughs> yeah. He ended up buying it, of course. Um he did he uh actually no, oh I take that completely back. I apologize. Is that Zach in his museum? No, so Zach didn't buy it. Zach has other paintings from this artist. Yeah, so sold it to a guy who has a gallery. And the guy who owns this gallery, again, in Groudon Rapids, Michigan, uh, he had it up in his gallery. It didn't have a whole lot of interest from people walking by, but he had nothing to report of it being haunted. However... That owner of the gallery doesn't have it up in his gallery anymore. It's now just in his storage. I wonder why. I wonder why. But I couldn't find anything about this specific gallery with that picture in it. So, don't know why, but yeah. So, going back to Zach Baggins. Zach Baggins tried to buy this from him. And the guy was like, no, I'm not selling it. It's going to stay in storage. But Zach had gotten in contact with the original painter, Bill. And Bill wanted to paint a picture for Zach. And he painted a, what he called a prequel to the original painting, The Hands That Resist Him. He painted The Hands Invent Him. And this is a different view, and it's a portrayal of the inside of the window from the original painting. That's probably also creepy. So Bill did not tell Zach what he was going to paint. And he refused to tell Zach what was going to be in it and what whatever else. He didn't give him any information about what he was going to paint for him. So he finished the painting and sent it off to Zach to his haunted museum, which I would still love to go to. We should. How I know, right? So, but Zach, according to him, before he even saw the painting and before it was even in his own museum, him and a few of his co-workers started hearing what sounded like a bicycle bell in the museum but there's nothing in the museum that would have that type of bell and he had reports from other people who worked for him saying it sounded like somebody was on like a bicycle or a tricycle and then I would hear the ringing of a bell but they could not find anything in the in his museum that would lead to that so guess what was in the painting (laughs) that Bill gave to Zach (laughs) There was a freaking tricycle with a bell on the tricycle. That is so creepy. That's just fucking creepy. So I want to know more about this painter because I feel like he's like yes. possessed or something and like <laughs> And that's the thing there's nothing that, that he's a painter. He's not really out in the open like other celebrities even if he is really good at his job and he is a successful painter. It's just I couldn't find anything on him, really. I found a few things about, like, Zach and and Bill, the artist, like, talking back and forth. And Zach's thinking that there is something paranormal about him. But I still don't think... I don't know. I just thought it was interesting that Zach Baggins got involved and it was on eBay. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) But just so strange that even after that, it was like he heard the tricycle before he had the painting. It's really, yeah, really so, fucking strange. That's so creepy. So strange. So that is the hands resist him, guys. Is it haunted? I don't know. But there's, I think there's something going on. There has to be. There's, there's something going on with that painting. Even if there's nothing to do personally with the artist, we don't know what happened between 1984 and the year 2000 for it to be in the back of an abandoned brewery. 
like yeah there's true. something that could have happened so so yeah um another note on mr baggins is he also has the dybbuk box yes <laughs> he has it <laughs> so well, not that particular one he has a dybbuk he box, has a dybbuk so yeah and um didn't we talk about James Dean Porsche in an episode? Yes, we did. That was our curses and coincidences episode. Little Zach bastard. Baggins also owns that. Right? Apparently he owns it. Little bastard, yeah. right? I think so, yeah. 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 Well, apparently he has that too. Nice. Oh. Yeah, just going all back. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's haunted or not. I just think it's really freaking creepy. And it it's always one of those things where when little kids start to say this is what I'm seeing or just looking at the picture and they feel like something scared them. I always feel like something's got to be true. Yeah. Yep. I don't know why. I just, I'm going to believe those kids. Because they have like, they're not like jaded by the world. They have like a sixth sense or something, I swear. Something. (laughs) All right. So I'm going to take a little detour and talk about some freaking cursed phone numbers. Have you ever just dialed one of those random haunted numbers? Have you heard of, like like the six 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 six? Have no. you ever tried that? Uh, the <laughs> only phone number I've called from anything was remember Soldier Boy had that song. <laughs> oh my god! Kiss me through the phone, and I called oh, that number. <laughs> <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> yeah, you could just leave him like a voicemail. Like it was oh, like this. How yeah, funny. It's funny. Oh, that's great. So um, I came across this phone number in Bulgaria that's supposedly haunted. And the phone number, I'm going to give it to you guys, is 088-888-888. I don't have long distance calling, so. Well, for those of us in the States, I have the number to dial before that, which is plus 359-888-888-888. So... There you go. There's the number. I wonder why eight. I don't know. It didn't give me an explanation. However, um, the CEO of a Bulgarian mobile company called Mobitel was the first owner of this phone number. CEO of the company. Whatever, right? Um, he passed away in 2001 at the age of 48. Like, all of a sudden he had cancer and there was no stop in it. And it just took him out and... There was nothing really specific besides that. So after he passed away, the phone number was then not exactly up for grabs, but then passed on to somebody else, right? Uh, The second owner of this number was a Bulgarian businessman. And I found some sites that said he might have been a mafia boss. And his name was Konstantin Dimitrov. Whoa, that's a name. Oh, yes, it is. (laughs) He... Owned a lot of farms, hotels, restaurants, apartments. He worked in trades. He was a businessman. After owning this number within a year, he was shot to death in Amsterdam at the age of 31. And then there was a third owner. And his name was also Konstantin, but it's Dishliev. So, another one. (laughs) Um, He was a real estate agent. And he was, after owning this number, he was shot also in 2005 but apparently he also had 130 million pounds of drugs on him oh jesus so, christ <laughs> so oh and i almost forgot the original owner the ceo guy there was rumors going around that somebody was trying to poison him also so i don't know if this number is exactly haunted but i do find it very odd that three people who owned this number yeah passed away within a year or two of owning the number even if they were doing something (laughs) like shady and shysty on the side still yeah that's odd (laughs) and the company uh mobitel they have now suspended the number and it is no longer in use so very odd yeah i know right who (laughs) know i know i thought it was interesting (laughs) so there's also These other numbers. And I found one in Nigeria in 2004. It pretty much, this is what the text message said. It was sent to this woman from an unknown caller. And her name is Oluchi Azubogu. Oluchi. I'm going to just call her O. 
So she was 22 years old at the time going to, you know, a local college. And then all of a sudden she got a text that said, beware, you will die if you take a call or text from these phone numbers. First phone number is 0802311199 or 0802222599. So she thought that was odd. <laughs> Would you not just immediately block well, those yeah, numbers? Well, yeah, but if it's a text from an unknown number and they just show you those numbers, I don't know how you can block them. And this was in 2004, so who knows? I'm sure there's a way to block them, though. So this scared Aluchi to the point where she immediately called and texted her friends and parents and said, I'm turning my phone off. So she did. Straight up turned her phone off and that was it. She never got those calls or text messages. The company who owns those phone numbers also said it was a hoax. However, in 2007, a bunch of people in Pakistan got emails and texts from multiple different usernames, groups, and, you know, unrecognizable numbers that were blocked. All of these emails, texts that they were getting were saying to not answer or call text from red numbers specifically. We all know that numbers don't show up as red on our phones when people call us, right? It just doesn't happen. However, apparently this was happening in Pakistan in the late 2000s. Apparently, if you did answer this phone call or replied to a text, you could die. And if you answered the phone call, there was a high pitch frequency on the other end that would make your brain explode, I guess. <laughs> Either way, it was a high-pitched noise that would hurt you severely. Apparently, people died. Did somebody died. die? I like, couldn't did, find how did they know? Any, any, like, correlation of this person answering a phone and dying, though. All of the articles I was reading, it was like, yes, there was some people who passed away. In, yeah, and also in 2007 in India, it was almost the same thing, but they were called devil numbers. And they have... 10 digit phone numbers in their local area and what the devil numbers are is somebody would call you with 11 to 14 digits and when you answered that number you would become ill or die or your phone would explode and apparently that happened too in india in 2006 and 2007 oh, fun. those same years it also happened in afghanistan where they called it the phone virus or the red virus. And they thought that people were actually getting sick from just answering the phone numbers just because there was like an actual virus that would make them physically sick. So yeah, those are the haunted phone numbers. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was like so anthrax wild. through the phone? Just like, don't answer these numbers. Don't answer this text. I'm like, but people did. Same, same here. Um, I did find some really silly YouTube videos on people actually calling. Because there's hella phone numbers. I saw more phone numbers when I started doing research. And there are some videos of, like, people calling the phone numbers. They don't always go through. There was a few that ended up going to, like, I think it ended up going to New York on one of the videos. And instead of it going to a voicemail or saying this number can't be connected, you know, dial your call again. Um, it just would have a beep and then hang up. But then his phone was like all black after that, like completely went black afterwards. And I can't, it wasn't one of the numbers I had. This what was, the heck? I don't remember. It was the 999 or the 66 number, 666 number. It was just like very odd. And I, you saw it on there. So I thought That's that was great. pretty interesting. It is on YouTube, but it was, it was just really interesting to find something I've never even heard of. I just thought it was so strange. And people straight up believe this. They're like, right. don't do it. Turn your phones off. People are getting sick from answering strange numbers. So, I don't know. Even more reason to just not answer the phone. <laughs> I want to know what people think about that painting, though. Everyone go online. I'll put it on our Instagram. But everyone just, like, go online yeah. and check it out. And he has others. He has a prequel to it. He also painted, like, what would be called a sequel to it. So maybe it's, like, a series of odd hauntings with these pictures. So Who knows if something was drawn to them, you know? Yeah, I don't even know. Like, my mind is going, like, what could it be? Is it, like, Right? That's even, that's a good question, paint, too. Or it? the canvas <laughs> that it's like... on. Where did he get it? You know? 
there's so many questions yeah. and the artist doesn't say anything. So it's hard to get anything about it. <laughs> well, Bill needs to hit me up. <laughs> it's part of a bigger, it's part of a bigger art project. See how many people you can convince. <laughs> Those are some haunted objects, guys. Let us know what you think. Hit us up on our Instagram at Weird Mythic Podcast. We're also on Twitter at Weird Mythic. Send us some emails and, you know, something inspirational so we could do another creepy episode at our Gmail at Weird Mythic Podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> and come see us at the yes. Dallas True yes. Crime Podcast Festival in August. I am going to have that linked below in everything. It's always yeah. going to be linked below until we go there so <laughs> so go there <laughs> yes i'm ex- i'm excited to plan like a special yes. episode for so that. i kind of already like, have we're gonna an have idea to come up with something that good. i was gonna surprise you with <laughs> no spoilers <laughs> all right well until next time Bye.